Thanks a lot. Uh, we're about to start up. And uh, first we have um, the, re really, the, the state-of-the-art and progressive radio host. He doesn't want me to say a lot about him, so I won't. Uh, Mr. Jay Diamond. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm just going to introduce you later tonight. And uh, next we have Vanity Fair columnist and America's favorite British contrarian, he wields a crowded kebab skewer displaying the charred likes of Ronald Reagan, Henry Kissinger, Mother Teresa, and Bill Clinton. He was recently voted the world's fifth top public intellectual by Prospect Magazine. Hitchens has written over 60 books and is the proud enemy of all religions. <laughs> Abandoning most of his comrades on the left, Hitchens vehemently supports Bush's war in Iraq. His latest books are Love, Poetry, and War and Thomas Jefferson. He's got a new book coming out, I think, in early 2006 called God is Not Great, The Case Against Religion. And uh, th that's coming in early 2006. Um, so, uh, Christopher, please join us. Thank you. Thank you. He doesn't want to be named, but somebody out there in the crowd was very nice to drive all of these people up here. And we, uh, we literally couldn't have done this with you because of the strike. Thank you. You know who you are. Um, next, we're, we have uh, Scott Ritter. He's the uh, straight-talking former Marine officer who the CIA wants to silence. Um, he, he, he considers himself, or he still considers himself a Reagan Republican, um, although he did vote for Kerry. And um, he, uh, he, was, he served in Desert Storm. He was right-hand guy to Norman Schwarzkopf. And um, he, in Iraq, he found himself in a dangerous game between Iraq and the U.S. regimes. In 2000, Ritter wrote that Iraq had no milita militarily significant stocks of prohibited weapons. He strongly opposes Bush's war on Iraq. His new book is Iraq Confidential from Nation Books. Scott Ritter. Thank you. All right, does this Scott's work? Scott's going to start us off. Yeah, he's going to start us off. I still like Randy Critico's Jack Nicholson imitation. Yes. Maybe he'll come back yes. out. Here. Wasn't it? <laughs> okay, Randy did do a great job. But now we'll sober up. And why don't we start off, why Iraq, Scott Ritter? Well, why Iraq? First of all, thank you very much for uh, giving me the honor and privilege for being here tonight to engage in uh, a much-needed discussion, debate, and dialogue about Iraq. Um, Contrary to the polarization in America today, Iraq is not a black and white issue. It's a deeply complicated issue, one that is uh, composed of many different shades of gray. Um, having said that, I'll state right off the bat that I am opposed to this war as much as one can possibly be opposed to this war. I am not a pacifist. I'm a former Marine. I spent 12 years as a commissioned officer in the United States Marine Corps, and I've gone to war for my country. I'm somebody who knows what war is, and I understand why we fight. And when I take all of this accumulated belief foundation that I have, and I apply it to the situation we find ourselves in Iraq today, I find that I cannot come up with any justification worthy of a single American life as to why we should be in Iraq today. There are many reasons that can be presented. Indeed, I myself have articulated a number of potential justifications for American involvement in Iraq that would lead to regime change of the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein. But again, I must reflect on the process that got us involved in this war. You know, we don't get to rewrite history. I know some people are trying to. Many of the proponents for this war have said, let's not talk about how we got there why we got there. That's water under the bridge. Let's instead focus on the fact that we are there and how do we determine where we are going. I will tell you this, as a, an intelligence officer who spent 12 years wrestling with difficult issues, including trying to solve difficult problems, you can't solve a problem until you first define the problem. Any solution void of a definition is no solution at all because what it is you're trying to solve. On the case of Iraq, we must take a look at how we got there. That is the foundation of our involvement. 
And ladies and gentlemen, it is as corrupt a foundation as you can possibly imagine. When I speak of war in Iraq, let's personalize it for a second. Let's speak of 161,000 American soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who are over there serving their nation, our nation. They're ours. They belong to us. They wear our uniform. On their shoulder, our flag is sewn. And they are willing to make the ultimate sacrifice in defense of our Constitution. And this is what we must focus on. They're not there to die for Iraqis. They're not there to die for anything other than the Constitution of the United States of America. That's the oath they took to uphold and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. What is the Constitution? Why is it so important? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is a document that defines who we are and what we are as a nation, as a people, a nation of laws. The rule of law is absolute, which means due process is absolute. You'll have people today talking about we're there for democracy. We're there to build a nation. But let's talk about the case that was made, because the case that was made by President George W. Bush for war in Iraq had nothing to do whatsoever with bringing democracy to the Iraqi people. It had nothing to do with liberating Iraq. It had everything to do with one thing, weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons, biological weapons, long-range ballistic missiles, nuclear weapons. The president said he knew they were there. He said this without any possibility of there being an alternative reality. The vice president said there could be no doubt that these weapons are there. This implies not that they're guessing, but that they're in possession of the facts. It implies certainty of knowledge. And yet, when called upon to produce this evidence, they could do no better than to gin up a national intelligence estimate that has, been turned, that has turned out to be not only highly politicized, but 100 percent wrong. All they could do is get Colin Powell to appear before the Security Council of the United Nations and issue a speech the totality of which has been proven wrong. He wasn't right on one thing. And yet we went to war. A war, again, that was about weapons of mass destruction. This is a fact that is put forward in the letter sent by John Negroponte, the, then the U.S. Ambassador of the United Nations, to the Security Council, saying that American troops have entered Iraq because Iraq has failed to comply with its obligation to disarm, and that international law dictates that America takes the lead in responding to this crime. Well, ladies and gentlemen, international law dictated no such thing. International law dictated that the Security Council remain seized of the event, that the Security Council would once again have to pass a Chapter 7 resolution, which it did not. The United States invaded Iraq in violation of international law, but more importantly, in violation of the Constitution of the United States of America, Article 6 of which is quite clear that when the United States of America enters into a treaty or international obligation that's been ratified by two-thirds United States Senate, that is the supreme law of the land. Our troops took an oath to uphold and defend that Constitution, and yet they went to war in violation of that Constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, this is about as un-American a war as one can possibly imagine, and we must register that fact when we talk about why we're there and where we're going. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. We are going to hear from Christopher Hitchens, but let me just make certain everybody remembers. Then what I'm going to do is encourage these fellows to talk to each other, and later still we'll take questions from the audience, so you might want to ponder what you're going to ask. But Christopher, I'm sure that provided plenty of grist. Well, yes, and also an admirable model of terseness, which I'll have to try and follow. Um, I'd like to say, and will try, um, I'd like to say first that it's a uh, great a pleasure for me and far more natural to be arguing this case against a, a right-winger and a conservative. The argument really in Washington, my hometown, has always been between those of us who favor taking the risk of regime change um, and those who don't. And uh, since the opinions of um, Ramsey Clark and Michael Moore don't weigh very much in Washington circles, the main argument has always been uh, with a certain faction of the right, actually with two factions 
the isolationist anti-Semitic forces grouped around Patrick Buchanan, and the so-called realists, uh, President Bush Sr., uh, some members of Kissinger Associates, the greater number of them actually, Lawrence Eagleburger, and Brent Scowcroft, whose summary of uh, the recent status quo in the Middle East is um, that say what you like about it, it was 30 years of peace. Suck on that, if you like, as a statement of realism. Um, and others. And I think it's, it's right that the argument be counterposed between, as it were, the radical and conservative point of view. Um, in 1989, when the collapse of the communist system occurred, it seemed to many people, including for a while myself, uh, that the era of the one-party state and the one-leader state was finally over, and the one-state ideology. Uh, certainly with the final end of Nicolae Ceausescu, it seemed possible that we had escaped uh, that model and that politics from then on could be rational. You remember there was talk even of a peace dividend at that time, uh, of the possibility of really paying attention with our resources and our techniques to long overlooked problems in Africa and elsewhere uh, and with uh, huge new frontiers of possibility um, in, in medicine and in science and above all a rough consensus on the idea of democracy. I once calculated how long that period which some called partly optimistically, partly pessimistically the end of history uh, had actually gone on. I, I, I can't remember now precisely how many days of it we had. About 130 I think uh, of the new era until uh, uh, Slobodan Milosevic invaded Bosnia and Saddam Hussein did not invade Kuwait but as you should and no doubt do remember uh, annexed, uh, abolished, fully occupied took possession of it, made it a part of Iraq, the unprecedented assault on the principle of the, of the United Nations, the abolition of one of its member states also full member in good standing of the, the Arab League, the Non-Aligned Movement and the, and the Islamic uh, Conference um, this was followed by the nightmare of Rwanda, which the international community did nothing to prevent, by the slow and unnoticed uh, 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 acquisition by North Korea and Iran of thermonuclear weaponry, and behind it all lurking, the deadliest threat of all, and the one that combines in its most horrible way the concept of the one leader with the one God and the one state and the one new empire and caliphate, the ideology of Islamic fascism. Now, the question really is a macro one, therefore, in my opinion, my submission to you, ladies and gentlemen. The macro one is this. Is it or is it not the case that coexistence between the United States of America and its allies and regimes of one-party theocratic or totalitarian ideology with expansionist and aggressive practices is impossible? I submit that if it isn't impossible, it ought to be impossible because it is most certainly undesirable. Uh, we are here today partly, but I think only partly, to argue about the rationale of the recent hostilities in Iraq. The truth of the matter is that every blunder that's been made in this, uh, in this period, in this epoch since 2001, is the consequence of having compromised for too long with the continued existence in power of Saddam Hussein, with, in other words, the private ownership of a very important country and a very long-suffering people by a psychopathic mafia. Uh, the shame of the United States policy is to have tolerated that for too long. The shame of the United Nations is to have tolerated that too long. The shame of the European Union is to have tolerated that for far too long. There is a faction of which I'm proud to be a member that says this coexistence was wrong, that 1991 should have seen the end of Ba'ath Party rule in Iraq, that if there's going to be an inquest and if there's going to be a post-mortem and a full accounting of our policy in Mesopotamia, and there should and must will, and will be one, then it has to begin no later than 1991, though I would myself backdate it to the decision by that heroic Nobelist and Baptist, uh, Jimmy Carter, to encourage uh, Saddam Hussein's invasion of Iran in 1979, the, the fonds et origo of all of our troubles in this region. Um, I don't want to outpace uh, uh, Scott Ritter's very um, uh, polite and condensed uh, Introduction. So I'll close on this observation and then we'll begin to exchange. Uh, on, on this point of the legality uh, of assuming the right to change the government of another state, I think uh, there are four points that absolutely must be borne in mind. A state is deemed to have lost its sovereignty and to have become subject to intervention and regime change on one of four conditions. That it has violated the Genocide Convention, of which we are signatory, 
Genocide Convention man mandates that in the case of uh, the advice of an attempt to destroy in whole or in part a national or ethnic group, that action be taken either to prevent or, if that's not possible, to punish uh, that action. That's, that's an obligation. Um, international law further states that a state has lost its sovereignty if it gives aid and comfort and harbors, uh, aid and comfort to, I should say, and harbors forces of international gangsterism, non-state actors who engage in indiscriminate violence against civilians, in other words, if it uh, commits repeated aggressions against neighboring states or occupations of their territory, and of course, if it violates the non-proliferation treaty or is in other ways discovered to have been fooling around with weapons of mass destruction. Iraq has violated all four of these very important precepts, or under the leadership of Saddam, had violated them several times. Another confrontation with the Saddam Hussein regime was inevitable. There's never, I've never heard a single argument from anybody who says that that contingency was an avoidable one. Another round with that regime, imploding even as it was, and becoming more dangerous as it imploded, was a sure thing. The question you have to face, and face as if you had to take the decision yourselves, not as spectators, not as consumers, uh, not as mere onlookers, as if you had to take it yourself, the decision you have to make is this. Who should determine the timing of that next inevitable confrontation? Should it again be left to Saddam Hussein, as it was when he decided to use the weapons of genocide on the people of Kurdistan, as it was when he invaded Iran, as it was when he abolished the existence of Kuwait, or was it time and long past time for democratic nations and for democratic forces within them to insist, no, that we will, discern, we, we will decide the timing this time, and we will move Iraq into the post-Saddam era, and we will free its people from their appalling imprisonment, and we will certify their state as disarmed, which could not be certified other than by regime change, and we will, we will prevent it from being used as a launching pad and training ground for gangsters from Abu Nidal on down. As I say, I think that decision was uh, taken long overdue and in some ways incompetently, but I'm extremely proud to have associated myself with that side of the argument, and I'm going to maintain that till the last dog dies tonight. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Unless Scott changes your mind. We Do can't you, tell the future, but... The, all, must be, all must be doubted and all is, um, all is available for I'll let, dialectical I'll, rationalizing. I'm sure you have something to say. But, but Christopher, do you think there was a, at the time of, of Bush's invasion, at the time of his attack, do you feel that Saddam still retained a, a credible ability to inflict damage on other countries um, in the United States? What I wrote in my short book on the subject, which is called, um, for the curious, uh, strangely invented book, um, A Long Short War, The Postponed Liberation of Iraq, which takes the war as continuous between 1990 and 2005. Uh, it was this, that the threat of weapons of mass destruction in 2003 from Iraq was, as I put it, uh, latent, not blatant. Thanks to the military victory in 91 and the work of UNSCOM afterwards, under the leadership of my friend Rolf Akeus and with active participation from Scott Ritter, it was possible to, to account for quite a number of those weapons, even though a Ministry of Concealment was still in operation in Baghdad, led by Kusai Hussein, a Ministry for Deception of, of Inspectors. Uh, since the invasion itself, we found things that we weren't even looking for, that we didn't know to accuse them of. For example, a plan, uh, we have all the documents of it, uh, in March 2003, a Ba'ath Party delegation going to Damascus to meet with the envoys of Kim Jong-il to buy North Korean missiles with longer range than was permitted by the inspections off the shelf. We didn't know they were even trying that. We know that now. Um, the nuclear centri centrifuge, the elements of which were buried in the garden of Dr. Mahdi Obedi, Saddam's chief nuclear physicist, and were uh, by him unearthed. He led the Marines to where he'd buried it under the orders of Qasai Hussein. Um, so, yes, of course, as long as Saddam Hussein was in power, it was not possible ever to relax, and certainly not if you were a neighboring country. Um, it was an unsleeping attempt to keep together what resources he could for a better day as the sanctions regime was breaking down, which it was. But don't forget that when I was arguing for regime change in Iraq in 2003, I was confronted every day by spokesmen of the anti-war movement who said, you can't do it. 
You can't attack Iraq now. You can't move your troops across that border. They'll all be killed. They'll all be killed by Saddam's poison gas weapons. They'll all be killed by his anthrax. That was the regular argument made, and people are not entitled to forget this. Anyway, I'm not going to let them. The regular argument made by the peaceniks in the Congress was, it's too dangerous. He's too heavily armed to do it. Now, let's all come clean about this then, don't you think? You don't want to come clean. You don't well, want to come clean. Scott a chance. Well, I'm going to keep on giving you the chance to come clean. Fair you'll get enough. your shot. You'll get well, your, I promise you, you'll get your chance. But right now, I want these two fellows to talk. And then, but, but save it, because we're not going home that early, so don't worry about it. Scott, I'm sure that, that you have some response to what Christopher's just said about the, the potential capacity, anyway, of Hussein to, to wreak damage not only on his neighbors, but maybe elsewhere. Well, it's interesting to, to hear Mr. Hitchens talk about the, the Ministry of Concealment, the, the terminology he used. Uh, the last title that I held with the United Nations was Chief of the Counter Concealment Investigations Team. So I think I, I stand before you as one of the most qualified people to talk about the issue of Iraqi concealment. Um, and I will say this, that in 1998, on the eve of my resignation, I shared your concern that Iraq might be hiding some aspects of its weapons of mass destruction. We as inspectors were unable to certify 100 percent compliance on the part of Iraq. We were concerned about certain aspects of their chemical weapons program, in particular those dealing with VX nerve agent. We were concerned about certain aspects of their biological weapons program especially those dealing with the potential of Iraq to have weaponized anthrax in dry powdered form. We were concerned about certain aspects of their nuclear weapons program, especially dealing with the high explosive um, uh, spherical devices that could be used as, as an implosion device for a nuclear weapon, not fissile material, but components of a weapon. We had no evidence that these existed. Far from it. We had the inability to confirm their final disposition. And because Iraq had lied to us, because Iraq had early on in the process of our efforts in Iraq actively concealed WMD material from us, we were in no position to accept at face value Iraq's contention that all weapons of mass destruction had been destroyed in the summer of 1991. So I will say that there was reason to doubt Iraq's contention that it had been completely disarmed of weapons of mass destruction. However, it's important to note a couple things. There's a lot of mythology that's come out. Mr. Hitchens mentions two of them. The mythology of the centrifuges underneath the rose bush in Mahdi Obeidi's front yard. You know, Mahdi Obeidi tells a heck of a story. It's, it's one that he didn't tell us when we interviewed him in Iraq over a period of time when he had plenty of opportunity to come clean. Oh, and his but family he, was in the hands of, the, of Saddam's police. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was in the hands of Saddam's police. Come on. We Get also real. had information that Mahdi Obeidi had hidden this material under his rose bush, and we were actively moving on this when, uh, when we got, the plug got pulled on us in December 1998, not by Saddam Hussein, by the way, but by Bill Clinton and the Clinton administration, who had no intention of allowing weapons inspectors to fulfill their mandate of disarmament, because the policy of the United States, ladies and gentlemen, was never about disarmament. It was about regime change from day one, 1991. Disarmament was an excuse, something that created the opportunity to facilitate regime change. But the more the inspectors pressed towards coming to a conclusion about Iraq's WMD, the more we threatened U.S. policy objectives of regime change. Mahdi Ubaidi, think about this, what he says that he hid centrifuge components under his rose bush under Kusai Hussein's instructions. Furthermore, he said that he went to Kusai's office and received these components from Kusai, specifically selected for the techno technological ability to reconstitute the program. Ladies and gentlemen, Kusai Saddam Hussein knows nothing about a centrifuge program. How could he select the critical components? There's only one person in Iraq who could select the critical components, and that was Mahdi Ubaidi, who did so when ordered by the Iraqi government to destroy this material in 1991. He said, I will not part with my life's work, and he buried this material under his rose garden in violation of an order from the Iraqi government. We now know this to be the case. No, he didn't hold this for 
continuation of a nuclear program. There was one man's vain hubris that held on to this. This is not evidence of a reconstituted weapons program. The guys who went to Syria to sell missiles, I happen to know them very well. Dr. Motor Al-Kamini, gentleman's a fraud from day one. He has a record of going around speaking out of school, trying to build the grand missile whose programs are never agreed to by the Iraqi government. This is a man who was involved in various fraudulent procurement activities from day one. This was not evidence of an Iraqi effort to procure material. And if the U.S. government wants to make the claim that it is, then the U.S. government should put these very documents before the American people so that we can evaluate them for ourselves. I will not accept at face value this notion that Iraq has somehow intended to procure weapons. No, ladies and gentlemen, what we know is this case. The CIA today has confirmed that Iraq destroyed the totality of its WMD programs in the summer of 1991. Far from being non-compliant, Iraq was in fact in full compliance with its obligation to this arm. It's that the United States was not willing to accept this finding, even when weapons inspectors started putting forward documentation that suggested this might be the case. This appears to be what we have to call a heuristic question, depending on actual verifiable information. Before I reply, I just have to ask you, do you say the CIA says Iraq was in full compliance in 91? I thought you earlier were saying 99. No, I'm saying today the CIA, with the benefit of the accumulation of knowledge that they've acquired post-invasion, yes. has put forward in the Iraq Survey Group's findings that Iraq destroyed the totality of its WMD in the summer of 1991. 91? Yes, sir. So the Camel brothers were lying when they defected to Jordan and said that they were helping to conceal a further weapons program? Uh, I think the Kamal brothers, when they spoke of concealment, spoke of activities that took place in the summer of 1991, so they were telling the truth. They were also telling the truth when they said that everything had been destroyed, because that is repeated over and over again in the testimony provided by Hussein Kamal, not only to the CIA, but to British MI6 and to the United Nations inspectors themselves, that all weapons had been destroyed on their orders in the summer of 1991. You see, because... Um Dr. Obeidi's book, well, I don't know why you sneer so much about the uh, rosebush element of it, um, but if anyone cares to read this book, it is called The Bomb in My Garden, which I must say is a slightly kitsch title uh, by Dr. Marty Obeidi. But uh, I, do, I do commend it to your attention. It's another strangely neglected book. It does, as well as describe what life is like for a nuclear physicist under Saddam Hussein, describes what life is like under fascism. And it also describes the, the courses he had to take in how to lie to inspectors and how to create dummy facilities for them to inspect, and how his family was held hostage when he was within e e uh, eavesdropping distance of any inspector. Um, and it does say what the nuclear centrifuge is, the crown jewels of nuclear physics, the hardest thing to acquire. And uh, of course, Kasai Hussein wouldn't know one end of a centrifuge from another, nor would I. That's why it was Dr. Abedi to, to whom the components were given. Um, the the uh, material discovered, and, and by the way, Dr. Abedi, when the arrival of American forces had occurred, went straight to David Albright, I believe I'm right in saying, and uh, led them uh, to the spot, which he hadn't been able to do, or had no possibility of doing before then. This was not in order, therefore, for it to form part of his private collection. You may well be right that your friend um, is a fraud, the man who went to the meeting in Damascus, but the record of the meeting with the North Koreans does exist. We know partly about it because the North Koreans uh, were given a deposit before the meeting began, quite a large one. And when the coalition arrived on the borders of Iraq, they broke off the negotiations to sell the long-range missiles, went back to Pyongyang, taking the deposit with them instead of returning it, which led to a row within the party. We have the whole CD of, that, um, of those conversations. But the most important concession, I think, that Scott Ritter has just made is that now we know, as he says, with all the information we've acquired since the invasion, we are enormously better informed about what Iraq was and was not doing. Absent an invasion, absent a, re a removal of the regime, we would be taking the regime's word for it. No responsible president of the United States could possibly report back to his Congress and his electorate that that was what he was doing. That would be an impeachable stupidity. We can now certify, we can now certify Iraq as disarmed. Good. Plus, positive. 
a direct result of regime oh, change, yeah. which is the only way inspection can be done. Mr. Ritter would never have set foot in Iraq well, if it hadn't been for the victory in Desert Storm. I have a question. For By you. all means. <laughs> okay. Then I want to get back to that gentleman who went to Damascus supposedly shopping because I think we have to deal with that a little bit. Well, this is all very fun. What, what was Hans, it, 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 here's what occurs to me. You say the only way we could be certain that he was in fact disarmed was to, to go in, invade, and occupy, and, and take a look. Yes. Then why did the president, seemingly under duress, why was he moved to let Hans Blix go in and certify that they had, they had uh, disarmed? Oh. What would well, have happened? Easy. Well, uh, so, so why did, so was the president lying? Was he being disingenuous when he said, okay, you're right, we'll go through the UN and we'll let Hans Blix and his team, his UNSCOM team, determine whether he has, has uh, still retained the capacity with respect to these okay. weapons of mass destruction. And by the way, the president, I think correctly, uh, threatened him that you better let, allow them unfettered access yeah, yeah. every place. So if you say, and if the president knew what you seem to, to posit now, that <laughs> the only way to be assured that, that he was disarmed was to go in and see for ourselves, why did he go through this, this facade, this, this scheme of letting Blix make believe he was trying to determine that? Well, I can see my macro points are going to have to stay on hold for a bit, but I'm quite willing to walk back the cat this way if you wish. Um, the sequence of events, as I recall it, was as follows. Uh, on the initiative of the administration, which called to the United Nations' attention the fact that a huge number of resolutions on weapons of mass destruction in respect of Iraq had gone unenforced, which was agreed reluctantly by a rather shamefaced UN. Um, they secured a nine to nothing vote, including the vote of Syria, on the Security Council uh, to say to Iraq by a certain deadline they had better prove what they'd done with the weapons they had disclosed. Now, I, I think this is a discrepancy between myself and Mr. Ritter, and I should be careful because of his superior expertise, but Iraq had given a list at a certain point. He said, okay, this was after the Kamel defection. Um, they said, all right, this, okay, you got us. This is what we've got. It wasn't a whole hell of a lot, but it was significant. They said, we admit to this much, but they'd never produced it. It hadn't been brought to the inspectors to be verified, tagged, bagged, and destroyed. And don't Let's have any confusion on what the UN inspectorate is. It's not an investigative body. It's not told, you go look. We'll let you look anywhere. It's a big country. You can send a few dozen people. Keep looking. We won't obstruct you. It's not their job, is it? The inspector's job is one of verification. They bring the evidence. They say, here's how we can prove our compliance. That never happened. In my opinion, that first resolution was enough authorization. Um, and I think it's uh, one of my few criticisms of Prime Minister Blair that for his own political purposes, he felt, he, regard, he felt the need of a second resolution. Now, at that point, uh, but this is a crucial point, it was the inspectors were reappointed, and Kofi Annan, I'll give him this much, said, I think we should reappoint Rolf Ikeus, the extremely brilliant Swedish socialist and diplomat who had run UNSCOM in the 90s and had destroyed more Iraqi weapons than the whole first Gulf War had. Mr. Ikeus had a proven record of success and a proven record of curiosity about the existence of these awful weapons. Mr. Blix, on the other hand, had already certified Iraq in the 80s as clean and had meanwhile certified North Korea as kosher. Um, the French vetoed and the Russians vetoed the appointment of Rolf Akiris, his nomination by Kofi Annan, in favor of Hans Blix. Don't ask me why, okay, though you just did. Nobody's perfect, Christopher. Well, Scott. <clears throat> and the UN in the meantime, as we now know, was an open sewer of corruption between Annan's office right through all of its institutions into the oil for food racket that was fleecing and murdering the people of Iraq. And in May of 2003, in May, had things remained as they were, the chair of the UN Special Committee on Disarmament would have been Iraq. And its chair would have been appointed by Saddam Hussein. And we'd have been in conformity with the UN resolutions and, and principles. That's what it would have meant. Well, get, get real, get that's, real. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a convenient convenient prediction of the future that never occurred, but I will say this, if they were the chair of the disarmament committee, uh, their statements and findings have no relevance whatsoever on the Security Council, which is responsible for making the final determination as to Iraq's disarmament status. You rightly point out 
that the original resolution 687 passed by the Security Council in April of 1991 calls for Iraq to submit a declaration that lists the totality of its holdings of weapons of mass destruction. It is the job of the weapons inspectors to go in and confirm the accuracy of this declaration, then oversee the disposition of this materiel. Correct. The burden of proof is firmly on the side of Iraq until the summer of 1991. A couple things occurred. A, one month after Security Council Resolution 687 is passed, this is a resolution that not only says Iraq must be disarmed, but links the continuation of economic sanctions imposed on Iraq in August of 1990, sanctions that at that time were linked to Iraq's withdrawal from Kuwait. Keep in mind that we liberated Kuwait in early 1991. There's now no longer a legal justification for the continuation of these sanctions. The United States puts forward this new resolution calling for the disarm of Iraq, saying that until which time Iraq is found to be in compliance, these sanctions will remain in place. But there is a clear black and white rendering in this document that says, A, if Iraq is found to be in compliance, these sanctions will be lifted, and B, makes no reference whatsoever to regime change, getting rid of Saddam Hussein. He's not part of the equation. But one month later, in May 1991, Secretary of State James Baker, in an appearance before the United States Congress, says, even if Iraq is found to be in compliance with its obligation to disarm, economic sanctions will be maintained until which time Saddam Hussein is removed from power. Witness the true policy objectives and intent of the United States. It's not about disarmament. It's about getting rid of Saddam Hussein, which is the only way you can explain what happens in June 1991. Let me remind you, I fought in that war in 1991. I know what it means to wage war against Iraq. I know what we were fighting for. I know what was it about. And I supported the notion that Iraq must be held accountable to the rule of law. And the rule of law is set forth in Resolution 687 says that if Iraq does not do what the international community says, then the ceasefire is no longer in effect and we must go in and finish the business and I would have been the first to volunteer and fight on that front line. We found a convoy of 100 vehicles carrying nuclear enrichment equipment that Iraq had denied having. They not only said we don't have nuclear enrichment equipment, they said we don't have a nuclear weapons program, period. Well, we proved that to be a lie. At that point in time, if I had my druthers, I would have withdrawn every single inspector from Iraq. I would have put the Marines back online, and we would have finished the job. Damn That's called straight. enforcing the rule right, of so law. What did the United States do? The Nothing. did the wrong thing instead, instead. they went to the Security Council, and they passed a new resolution, 707. And this is where you're wrong, Mr. Hitchens, because they did at that point in time transfer the burden of proof off of the shoulders of the Iraqis, and on to the shoulders of the inspectors. Yes, Resolution 707 says Iraq must resubmit its declaration and be honest. But it also told the inspectors to go into Iraq and search for the hidden weapons. Do you see the contradiction built in? On the one hand, we tell the Iraqis they must submit an accurate declaration. And yet we say to the inspectors, regardless of what the Iraqis do, go in and search for the hidden weapons. And we did. But the problem is the United States built into the process the notion of proving the negative, and that can never happen. Witness case one, ballistic missiles. I carried out an investigation that went well over a year, and in October of 1992 made a report to the, security, to the intelligence community of the United States that said we have accounted for all of Iraq's ballistic missiles. But because disarmament wasn't the game, the CIA rejected this report, the director goes before the Senate and says there's 200 missiles left in Iraq. Mathematically impossible, but it doesn't matter. When asked where these missiles are, part of the equation included missiles on the back of trucks. Now, we did inspections looking for missiles on the back of trucks. In a nation the size of the state of California, how do you do this? Very difficult. We did it. We stopped convoys. We searched inside. We found no new missiles. What does this mean, that the missiles don't exist, or we just got the wrong trucks? You see, this is a process that will go on forever, and that's what the yes. United States wanted. Not what Iraq wanted, because we now know Iraq got rid of everything in the summer of 1991. This is a process the United States wanted, because the mission was not disarmament. The mission was regime change. Why? Why? Yeah. Now we come down. You guys, this, this is the part that I want everybody to understand here. 
Stop evaluating Iraq from a national security perspective. You will go insane. If you evaluate America's policy in Iraq from a national security perspective, it makes no sense across the board. We de destroyed Iraq's military in 1991. Their economy was in ruins. Iraq represented a threat to no one outside the people of Iraq, and I will give you this. It was a horrific dictatorship that was oppressing its people in the most brutal fashion, but that's not why I go to war, ladies and gentlemen. I go to war when someone threatens my country, and we had terminated that threat in 1991. But the president, in selling this war, selling this war, said the following, that Saddam Hussein, this is a speech he made in October 1990, Saddam Hussein is the Middle East equivalent of Adolf Hitler who requires Nuremberg-like retribution for his crime of invading Kuwait. We went to war because the international community in the form of the Security Council of the United Nations said Iraq must be expelled from Kuwait but made no mention of regime change. But when you link Saddam with Hitler, you have trapped yourself with your own rhetoric. Saddam's survival after the initial Gulf War created a political problem for the president. Regime change was not about national security. It was about solving a political embarrassment of the president of the United States, an embarrassment that was passed on from one president to the next to the next. This has nothing to do with the legitimate security interests of the United States. No, but what was the embarrassment? Saddam Hussein's continued survival. Yes. When you call a man Hitler, you cannot allow Hitler to continue to rule in Iraq. And that was the problem. The president called him Hitler. While punishing no, no, his that, people. So why did, why While did punishing his people with the, sanctions. Pardon? While punishing his people with sanctions. And not only allowing him to remain in power, but being complicit with his remaining in power. Yeah, but, but American helicopter gunships were grounded so that Iraqs could be put back in the air. And they watched while, the, while they were used on the Shia and on the Kurds. And Schwarzkopf gave permission for that genocidal operation. We're complicit. We can't walk away from this. Iraq is a responsibility, and I'm afraid, uh, though I'm glad to see you nod, Mr. Ritter, but that means you can't be exhaustive when you say, no, I'm, who's cackling? Oh, it's that comedian fellow. Um, he, was, he was okay, I thought. Uh, uh, he, he cackles for a living. Um, he's doing it again. Uh, you're supposed to be crying at this point. Um, if you have, no, because ladies and gentlemen, if you have tears, prepare to shed them now. General Schwarzkopf, in our name, gave Saddam Hussein operational permission to commit genocide. That means we're stuck with a responsibility. That means that, there's more, that we are responsible for more than just our own safety. I'm sorry to say, for Mr. Ritter to argue that only in case of an attack on the United States are we responsible is fair and defensible, but it's not really enough to say it. We owe a debt to the people of Iraq. We've, we've saddled ourselves with them, their society and their state, as our responsibility for a long time now. And we're beginning only, only now to begin to pay off some of that debt by helping them into a post-Saddam era, by giving them a lot, of, a lot of aid, by lifting the sanctions at last, and by assisting the evolution of a federal democracy with all the hazards and disappointments that are, inv that are involved. That's the very least we could have done. But the alternative was complicity with violation of the Genocide Convention, uh, with a, a regime that attacked and occupied neighboring states, and which harbored international terrorists. And as you must have noticed from Scott Ritter's very uh, imposing narrative of his own experience, couldn't be trusted an inch when it came to any conversation about WMD. Well, again, Voila. Here, here, my here's, my, here's my problem. I, I have no problem with the notion of your four definitions of how nations lose sovereignty. The problem is, with all due respect, you don't get to make that call. You can have your opinion, but when we talk about holding a nation to account, there must be due process. And to jump to the conclusion that Iraq has committed genocide without due process making that finding, to jump to the conclusion that Iraq continues to possess weapons of mass destruction without due process making that finding, to jump to any conclusion that you put forward without due process shows a total disrespect to the rule of law. And if you're going to embrace democracy, you must embrace the rule of law. I'm, um, I'm, uh, I'm, very, I'm very happy to take the opportunity of, of not just seconding you in that. I'd rather try and outdo you in, in saying that. I mean, I think you're more right than you know. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a member and a supporter of a group called Indict, which was founded by a very important leader of the parliamentary left in the British Labour Party, ruling party, Anne Cluid is her name, heroic woman, 
who we for years uh, before the war were pressing the British Attorney General to uh, indict Saddam Hussein and to bring in a bill uh, that would state the reasons why he should be arrested and put on trial. Uh, these would begin probably with Operation Anfal, the attempt to exterminate the Kurdish people, but uh, Britain and other countries had, just, had uh, standing a jurisdiction in it as well because of the holding of hostages in Kuwait as insurance, uh, the, uh, one of the most illegal things a state can do, take the civilians of other nations and use them as human shields, which had happened to many of our citizens and many of yours. The, the, bill could, the indictment could have gone on forever. We could have wheeled from Kanan Makia's office at Brandeis, we could have wheeled into court uh, the steel filing cabinets that contain the genocide indictment at any time, in but any we, country. But we did it wasn't done. It wasn't done. And it's, a, it's an international disgrace, and it's a shame on both the governments of, the, of Britain and the United States. In case anyone has another opinion or impression, I don't stand here as the uh, representative of the United States government. Um, in fact, I sometimes wonder if they could make a decent case for regime change, I could have some more time off. Uh, but because they're so bad at it, doesn't mean that the case uh, should not be made. So if you, want to know how, if you want to know how fucked up your republic is, that's how fucked up it is. All right. Getting, getting back to what the point you made that it's not about, it was never about disarmament, it's about regime change, and you cite as the, the reason the, the declaration by President George H.W. Bush that he's Hitler. And you seem to make a big, you put a lot of importance in that. Well, he said he's Hitler. After, the, after he said that, he's, he'll lose face if he doesn't knock him off. But why would President Clinton honor any particular uh, obligation to, to save the face of the president who preceded him and therefore launch another eight-year campaign for regime change because George H.W. Bush said eight years ago that, well, you know, this guy is Hitler, but so President, is it really credible to say President Clinton felt he had to say, salvage the, the honor and integrity of his predecessor who might have, who made the remark that we, this man is akin to Hitler? Well, again, the, the short answer to that is domestic American politics. The long answer is that, look, George Herbert Walker Bush had a political problem with the continued survival of Saddam Hussein, one that the CIA remarked on in March 1991 with an estimate that said Saddam Hussein has but six months to live if we can continue to contain the man with economic sanctions. This will destabilize him and this will promote the coup from within. It's wrong to say regime change early on because the first Bush administration had no intention whatsoever of changing the regime. They wanted Ba'athists in control. They wanted a Sunni-dominated dictatorship in control because they recognized that there was no viable option uh, to replace Saddam Hussein, that if you remove Saddam Hussein and the Ba'athist party, Iraq will devolve into chaos and anarchy because re regardless of the despicable nature of the regime, it re represented the glue that held that country together. They didn't want regime change. They wanted name change. They simply wanted Saddam removed and replaced with somebody who looked like Saddam, talked like Saddam, behaved like Saddam, who wasn't named Saddam. <laughs> this is why they put forward Resolution 687, which created the conditions to contain Iraq through the maintenance of economic sanctions. Sadly for the Bush administration, Saddam Hussein survived longer than six months, creating a problem for the president. What to do? They now lacked a policy to deal with Saddam Hussein. Well, they came up with a new policy in October of 1992 called regime change, authorized, but again, it's name change. It authorized the CIA. It was a lethal finding published by the president, covert do secret document, covert policy, that authorized the CIA to use whatever means necessary, up to and including lethal force, to remove Saddam Hussein from power. October 1992, but they never had a chance to implement this because in November 1992, Bill Clinton wins the election. Now, the Clinton administration comes in and from November 92 to January 93 puts out feelers to the Iraqi government saying that we believe we can find the conditions under which economic sanctions can be lifted. We need to work with the Iraqis. The Iraqis were gloating about this. I write this in my book about a meeting with, at that time, Amr Rashid, who wasn't quite the oil minister, but on his way to being an oil minister, saying all the problems are going to be resolved really soon. The Clinton administration is going to end this nightmare. The Bush administration was aware of the fact that Bill Clinton said, I'm a Southern Baptist who believes in deathbed conversions and I think we can get Saddam Hussein to change his way. That's why on the same day that Bill Clinton took his oath of office, 
The United States was bombing Iraq. Now, how can you, as the new commander-in-chief, talk about lifting sanctions against a nation that you're actively engaged in military operations again? Well, he tried. And by the spring of 1993, he was getting ready to move forward, and then something else occurs. It's called the assassination attempt against George Herbert Walker Bush. He was supposed to visit Kuwait. There's now this attempt on his life, or this alleged attempt, because it's funny. When the FBI investigated, a couple things occurred. At that time, there was a prohibition against using testimony derived from torture. And when the Kuwaiti government presented the six defendants, they recanted their confessions and said it was done under torture and there was obvious signs of distress. So the FBI threw the confessions out, did a forensic investigation of the explosive material, only to find, that, yes, it was Iraqi in origin, but it came to Kuwait in 1991 when Saddam Hussein occupied, or 1990, and it stayed in Kuwait when Saddam Hussein left in 1991, meaning it was under the control of the Kuwaiti government when the assassination attempt was supposed to occur. The beauty of this, though, isn't that this was a false allegation is that Clinton acted on it by sending cruise missiles into the intelligence headquarters, thereby confirming this, not only in terms of, you know, giving it the perception of reality, but politically as well. Now the president is tied to this policy, but he's not active on it. Yes, the CIA goes forward. They create this wonderful umbrella organization called the Iraqi National Congress, headed up by this great Iraqi politician named Ahmed Chalabi. But it doesn't do a very good job. It doesn't do a good job at all. The CIA is not fully funding it, not fully supporting it. In 1994, Bill Clinton's inability to deal with the continued rule of Saddam Hussein becomes a political liability, political liability at home when Newt Gingrich and the Republicans sweep into the Congress using Clinton's inability to deal with Saddam Hussein as political ammunition on the domestic front. That's why in 1995, Bill Clinton tells the CIA, get rid of this man once and for all by the summer of 1996 so he's no longer a lead weight around my shoulders going into the 96 election. Bill Clinton was now fully committed to a policy of regime change, ACA name change in Iraq, not because he was sympathetic to George Herbert Walker Bush, because he was trapped by domestic American politics. Um, I've just remembered uh, what the bad reason was for not indicting um, Saddam Hussein, by the way, not bringing in a proper bill of indictment. Uh, it wasn't just a bad decision on its own. It was made for a, a, a bad reason. When most of the uh, worst of his crimes were being committed, the invasion of Iran, the genocide in northern Iraq, and the uh, abolition of Kuwait, uh, at, at almost all of those material times, he was a semi-official ally of the British and American governments, and a trial would have enabled him to to uh, deploy the defense that they'd known at the time and they had no right to be surprised. So that's what we basically discovered when we pressed the British Attorney General for, um, on, on this point. Um, I don't disagree very much uh, with uh, Mr. Ritter's uh, condensed history of, of the evolution of Iraq policy. I think it stops short of a um, very important decision by the United States Senate to pass the Iraq Liberation Act, which was an open debate. Everyone knew what they were voting on and for. Every single senator voted for it. No senator voted against. It has been the policy of the United States since 1998 that the government of Saddam Hussein shall be removed. That was the right policy then. It's the right policy now, and it was democratically arrived at. Um, I would further add that I feel no more bound in my own opinions on this by anything said by any of these presidents uh, than I was when James Baker asked what his justification was this week for the first Gulf War said after a very long and thoughtful and after a while agonizing pause, uh, jobs. Now, I'm not bound by what he says, not bound by what Bush said, and certainly not bound by anything Clinton said. We have to figure this out for ourselves. This is a citizen's responsibility now. It's a matter of solidarity with the democratic forces in Iraq, and it's a matter of the, the possibility, the fighting chance, uh, that a, a spring of democratization can be brought to the region, as well as that the non-proliferation success, which is one, whatever haphazard route we came to it by, Iraq is now certifiably disarmed, or weapons of mass destruction, uh, can be extended. Uh, Colonel Gaddafi of Libya was induced to capitulate on this point and to place all his fissile and other suspicious material in our hands. They're all now under lock and key in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. I think that's where they ought to be, just like I think the dock is where Saddam Hussein ought to be. For, uh, Mr. Uh, Gaddafi did not capitulate to Kofi Annan or to Jacques Chirac, Saddam's pimp, or to Gerhard Schroeder, Saddam's bum boy. Well, um, he, he capitulated to Blair and to Bush. He said, I've had enough. 
Uh, we can't go on like this anymore. And by walking back that cat, ladies and gentlemen, uh, finding where Libya got all this stuff, and it was always more than we thought, as it is with Iran, more than we'd suspected or alleged, as it is with North Korea, more, not less, than we suspected and alleged, they were able to identify its origin in the AQ Khan nukes are us, Walmart in Pakistan. And now AQ Khan is where he ought to be, which is under house arrest. This isn't perfect, but it is progress, and it is worth arguing about, and we have the responsibility for it. We are not spectators here. We're not onlookers. We're not consumers. Christopher, and, and Scott might know more about this than I do, I remember, and I, I can't document what I read, but I remember reading a rather lengthy op-ed someplace, and maybe I'm, I'm hallucinating it, but the, the, the gist of it was that what happened with respect to Gaddafi yielding these weapons and storing them at Oak Ridge was the product of a very lengthy 10 or 12 year negotiation that also happened with, that was going on during the whole of the Clinton administration and which saw its culmination at that time about a year ago. Am I, do I no, have this you, right? No, you haven't elucidated that at all. Um, and it, it doesn't, I don't believe it contradicts what I say. I mean, I talked to the, um, the British ambassador in Tripoli, uh, who's now in Iran, and not long ago about this, he's free to talk about it, uh, was the, one of the chief negotiators. He said, look, there were three ways in which it happened. There was, uh, for once, good intelligence. They knew so, so much about what Gaddafi was doing, uh, how, so much about what he had, that when they went to him and said, look, what about this? He was, he was appalled to discover that they'd got him cold. Then there's been a very long discussion about bringing Libya back into the tent after the Pan Am atrocity and the sanctions that were connected to that and the, the, re, the renormalization of relations with most European countries. That's most contributory. And then he said, and then there's Iraq. He realized the game wasn't worth the candle. And he was impressed by the, by the fact that there was a point beyond which the United States could no longer be bluffed or, or, or teased or bullied or you know, just told to you know, keep looking and we'll play hide and seek. And that's, okay, it's over. We give up. But he gave up to, that's why I mentioned it, to Bush and to Blair, not to Blix or Annan or Chirac or Schroeder. And, he, and the stuff is in Oak Ridge, which is exactly where it ought to be. And we should be proud that that's the case. And though all those who were involved in bringing out about the disarmament of Libya so peacefully have a right, I think, to some praise. And I would give though them... they never get it. I, will, I, will, I, for one, will give them praise for help for getting rid of Libya's weapons of mass destruction. It represents a process that should have been applied to Iraq as well. And had it been applied to Iraq, 2,125 plus Americans would be home with their families alive. 15,000 Americans whose lives have been torn asunder would have their bodies intact, their mental facilities intact, and tens of thousands, if not more, Iraqis would be alive, albeit under a dictatorship. But I would have to say that I would, for one, prefer oh. to be an Iraqi under Saddam than an Iraqi under a brutal American occupation. One that is okay. One okay. that I must point out. One there that I go. must point out. Steady, steady. We'll get there to you. Go. We'll get to you. Relax. Well, no, I, it was about time that we started to disagree. I think. Well, uh, and, and, and and I will. When you say it's all been much that James Baker's statements have no relevance to you, that the statements of the President of the United States have no relevance no, to I you, then you are that. saying that the rule of law has no relevance to you. The rule of law is absolute. Yes, the United States Senate did in fact pass the Iraq Liberation Act in 1998, but Section 8 of that specifically prohibits the use of American force in removing Saddam Hussein from power. So don't make a linkage between that policy and what occurred in 2003. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, no what occurred in 2003, Section 8 most certainly does. It says that the United States has a policy of regime change, supporting an opposition, but it out prohibits the use of American military power to achieve this objective. That is 180 degrees different from the policy that was undertaken by the Bush administration in 2003. I'm not here to defend Saddam Hussein or his regime. Well, don't do it then. I'm not. I'm here to defend the United States of America and our way of life. And I'm here to tell you right now that if you support 
this war, if you support this occupation, you support a process that represents the erosion of what it means to be an American. You represent a process that legitimizes illegal wiretaps in the name of national security. You represent a process that allows the President of the United States and his administration to deliberately falsify information when presenting it to the Congress of the United States. And I need to remind you that when you lie to the Congress in the conduct of your official duty, that, sir, is a felony that constitutes a high crime. That is what we talk about when we speak of impeachment. Good. Well, now, as, uh, uh, as I never said, um, uh, uh, Section 8 of the Iraq Liberation Act was not and is not the warrant for the deployment of American forces. That, of course, had to be separately applied to, uh, applied for, excuse me, uh, to the Senate and the Congress and was uh, granted. But the, I simply said it became the policy of the United States, correctly in my view, that the government of Iraq should be changed, the post-Saddam era should Again, when I say I'm not bound by anything James Baker says or chooses to say or finds himself saying, I say no more than what I hope any citizen could say. I'm not bound by these fatuous remarks. It doesn't mean I, I pay no attention to uh, fatuous remarks made by American politicians. But that, excuse me, sir, has nothing to do with the rule of law. And those of you who applauded uh, Mr. Ritter's very glib statement that the uh, process applied to um, Libya should have been applied to Iraq, perfectly missed or chose to miss the point that had just been made, which was the process in the case of Libya was the example of the disarmament of Iraq for its repeated noncompliance. We can't run this experiment. We can't run this policy without precedent. We can't run it as if we will never resort to force. We can't what, have what weapons did you want Saddam to give up? The ones what? he destroyed in the summer of 1991? Excuse me? Which weapons do you want him to give up? They were all gone in the summer of 1991. The CIA has already confirmed this. What weapons is he supposed no, to no, turn no, over? No, 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 no. The we listen, we've, 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 uh, we've concurred on this. The, Wait, we're going to give you a chance the, to ask questions. Uh, Let them talk to each other the, for a while. The inspections of 2002 and 2003 to discover what had happened to the weapons the Iraqis had declared long after 1991. And they if weren't you want to, if, you, if you are beginning to have your head spin about this, order of precedence, ladies and gentlemen, you can simply go and Google the name Rolf Ikeus, E-K-E-U-S, the head of UNSCOM, and see what he has to say about this. Uh, he's the greatest authority in the world on the matter. Um, I think you'll find that anyone believing that, there was, that Iraq posed no threat, had no ambitions in the uh, nuclear and chemical and biological weapons area in 2002 would have been fooling themselves and would have been in the degrading position, furthermore, of having to take the word of Saddam Hussein, a proven liar, who ran a Ministry of Concealment run by one of his sons. Now, these are the choices a president has to make. You, in these circumstances, in these grave days, have to put yourself in that position. You're not just commentators and theater critics for presidential rhetoric, some of which can sometimes be tiresome. <laughs> now, um, I'll have to add a couple of things, at least one anyway, before I uh, hand the microphone back to Mr. Ritter. Iraq is not occupied by its Iraq is not occupied <laughs> it's okay no believe me I've seen a whole lot worse um, and hurt Iraq is not occupied by President Jalal Talabani okay? President Jalal Talabani is not in occupation of his own country he's the first elected president Iraq has ever had I think it's fair, furthermore, to say that without the presence of American and British soldiers there, there would not have been that election. But is this occupation, as you, under, is this occupation, as you understand? President Talibani's people, 10 years ago, were living in poisoned and ruined and gassed towns, a despised, mass-murdered minority driven onto the hillsides out of their ruined cities. I think it's rather marvelous that a man of that, of that caliber and bravery, the leader of the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, the corresponding party, by the way, in Iraq, of the Socialist International, of which I'm myself a member, uh, should be able to run for election and win uh, with the votes of Iraqis and Kurds uh, of all stripes. That's not, he's, it's an insult to say he's occupying his own country. He's the first leader the Iraqis have ever had the chance to choose 
themselves. And if it took soldiers to do it, then we should be very proud of it. And anyone who says... And I'll make a pact, and I'll make a pact with anyone on this, any question in the future, or Mr. Rittenau or our chair, I will not speak for the dead or presume to do so if they won't. But I don't like hearing the dead spoken for, and I suspect of grave demagogy and bad faith anyone who makes the assumption that they can invoke the names of our dead in their own cause. I promise I won't do it. And if I did, you'd see how ludicrous and parodic it would look. So don't do it yourself if you take my moral advice. But, but it's obscene to do it, and it shouldn't be done. But Christopher, the president has done it. I know. The, pres <laughs> the president I know. has, has, has I know. justified there the continuing things, of the war things, based on the people. There are two things I believe that should never be said. One is, if you support a war, that it must go on by definition, because otherwise those who have already died have died in vain. Oof. There's no war that couldn't be justified by a rhetorical sleight of hand like that. That's sheer demagogy, too. It commits the same obscenity. I've written this many times. Well, but if that's wrong, um, then it's wrong also to say uh, that because of our dead, a war is not worth fighting. The moral question of deciding, ladies and gentlemen, for yourselves and debating with others whether or not a war is just is one of the oldest questions before humanity. It's a very important matter, quite complex and quite intense. It cannot be discussed by those who say that uh, only a war is just if it leads to no death. That's morally frivolous. It's morally null. It's ahistorical. It's silly. You should give it up. You look well, like fools uh, when you try. Mr. Wall, due respect, um, <laughs> you know, I, I need to probably remind you for just a second that I served as a commissioned officer in the United States Marine Corps in time of war. Uh, so I, I know you, full you well no. what it means, full well what it means to take Marines into harm's way. I also understand the consequences of these actions. I don't invoke the loss of American life lightly. In fact, I chide Congressman Murta, who speaks out against the war today, citing the significant loss of American life. With all due respect to the former colonel who served in combat in the United States Marine Corps, we put 5,000 Marines across the beach at Iwo Jima, and that was a war worth fighting and a loss that must have been sustained at that time. We lost more Marines in Okinawa, again, in a cause worth fighting. It's not about 2,100 dead Americans in Iraq, because if this was a war worth fighting, 21,000 is not an insignificant loss. 210,000 is a loss that is heavy but must be sustained if this is a war worth fighting. But what I implored every American before we went to war to consider is this. Put yourself in the shoes of a Marine Corps rifle company commander. And now write that letter home. The one that tells mom and dad, sister and brother, that their boy will no longer be celebrating Christmas or Thanksgiving or birthday. It better be one hell of a letter. It better be a letter that's more about flag, God, duty, honor. It had to be about a cause worthy of the sacrifice, and the reason why I invoke the numbers is because there's 2,125 letters that are not doing the job. This is a war that's not worth the loss of one American because it's a war based upon a lie. If we wanted to go to war to liberate Iraq, the president should have made that case, but he didn't. He made a case only about weapons of mass destruction, and this was a case built on a lie, and there's no way the revisionists of history can undo that. Well, as I've already, I, I won't, I'll stop saying this if you'll stop saying how many times you were in the Marine Corps. I'm not here to represent President Bush. I'll have to say it again. Uh, but I will have to say that Cambridge, one has to defend him against certain kinds of witless defamation, as that he's doing this for his daddy or um, he's doing it for the profits of uh, his uh, of friends in politics and so forth, frivolous and uh, flippant remarks of this kind. And as a matter of fact, in his uh, speeches to the United Nations, he mentioned many other aspects of the crisis with Iraq as well as weapons of mass destruction. You can look up the speeches. I, I'm not going to replay them for you, but you, they're there to be looked up. I'm sorry, though, that I'm, so there's something in me that is not going to take a lot of ethical rhetoric, uh, let alone humanist rhetoric, from someone who's just said that if he was an Iraqi, he'd prefer to live under Saddam Hussein. I haven't got over that yet. Right. 
Well, let me, let me pose it in a different way. Which, in other words, way. means you would prefer, because you aren't an Iraqi, it's as good as saying they'd be better off under Saddam Hussein. And there are implications of that, too, because American mm. soldiers would have had to die to keep Saddam Hussein going pretty soon. After all, it was Schwarzkopf, who was willing to run the risk of losing American lives, who gave permission to Saddam Hussein to renew genocide in Iraq. American soldiers were being killed then, too. American soldiers have been killed on the wrong side in the Middle East. The, um, and maybe, again, the whole reason why, that's why I mentioned earlier, the, the, the disgraceful refusal to indict Saddam Hussein properly because of the past complicity. Part of the case that we have to make for regime change involves the correction, uh, the restitution that we need to make uh, for a, a previous atrocious uh, policy and conduct for which the Iraqi people uh, have a long memory, even if we do not. Not a single American life was lost from 1991 to 2003 in Iraq in combat to save the Iraqi people. Nor was a single American loss, life lost in Rwanda to prevent 800,000 Africans from being butchered in, in a regime that says, as abhorrent as Saddam is saying, let's remember, America is not here to solve the world's problems. America is here to solve its problems and figure out how it can best interact with the rest of the world. And I would advise the President and those who support this ongoing policy of aggression in Iraq to think twice about what the next step will be, because Iraq is not occurring in a vacuum, ladies and gentlemen. It's part and policy of a national security strategy of the United States published in September of 2002 that speaks of dividing the world into spheres of national interest that we, the United States, can inject ourselves unilaterally, preemptively, and militarily at our own time of choosing. This is not a policy of sound interaction. This is a policy of global imperialism that will lead to much more death and destruction. Don't you think... <laughs> yeah, we will, we will. Don't you we'll, think it's time for the... We will, we uh, will, in a few minutes. I not know. that I don't love all your questions. No, 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 but I'm, I'm enraptured some of them by what's going good, on but, here. Um, I have a feeling that the lot of people came to ask questions as well as to listen to. You got to leave? Us. No, no. Um, I'm, I'm saying, I don't think they I have more to saying, either. Bring I it on, if you know Ritter I mean. looks like he's here for the duration. We'll get to it. I, okay. I promise that Christopher is right. I want to assure everybody, assuage any doubts you might have, that we're going to send you home without giving you an opportunity to unburden yourself the way we've all been doing up here. So we will do that, but I just want to get to a few things. Well, I think that maybe, maybe you should flesh out, for Christopher and the people listening, Scott, what uh, the reasons why you believe, in fact, that the Iraqi people, pardon me, the, the, the I'll have a ham on rye. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, the reasons why you feel the Iraqis were better off living under Saddam Hussein than under the, the American uh, rubric. Well, I'll base that it on... That seemed to offend Christopher, and it might have offended well, it some offend, other people. It I offend, heard some, some Twitters there. It so. might offend a, a number of people. Let me, let me put it into a perspective, a perspective that begins in 1991 as a weapons inspector in Iraq in December, looking at a nation that's still living off of basically the fat of its former wealth including fat, by the way, obtained through the rape and pillage of Kuwait. Um, Baghdad was awash with Kuwaiti goods that were derived illegally, and it was enough fat to sustain Iraq into this period of economic sanctions. But I watched Iraq delve deeper and deeper and deeper into a darkness that I don't think anybody in this audience, unless you were an Iraqi living at that time, can understand. It's the darkness, not of the tyranny of Saddam Hussein, but the darkness of the tyranny of economic sanctions. Economic sanctions that were responsible for the deaths of between 700,000 and 2.2 million Iraqis, however you want to calculate it, it's a huge number. Now, I also watched an Iraq that was desperate to try and get these sanctions lifted. An Iraq that recognized that the United States would never allow these sanctions to be lifted, even if Iraq complied with its obligation to disarm. And we now know, thanks to the CIA, that Iraq did, in fact, disarm in the summer of 1991. It's not a debatable point. Mm. What their intents were, CIA I don't know. I can't get into the mindset of Saddam Hussein. I can only deal with the facts. But the point is this, that the Iraqi government under Saddam Hussein did whatever it took to try and get the status of Iraq away from being one of the poorest nations in the third world back on track to being a modern technologically advanced nation. And this included 
Oil for food sanctions violations. Not going to deny it. He stole billions of dollars from the oil for food program. But you know what? That's Iraqi oil. And he took that money. And with all due respect to the people who speak of palaces and this, I saw Iraq get better. I saw the economic life of the Iraqi people get better. I saw the roads get better. I saw Iraqi people going back into, hotel, into restaurants. I saw Iraqi people going into parks. It wasn't perfect. If you spoke up against Saddam, you were arrested. But I saw things improve. <laughs> I'm not here to defend the nature of the regime. I'm making a statement that in January of 2003, you could walk the streets of Baghdad without fear of being stopped by an American patrol. Yeah, that's true. In January 2003, you could go to sleep at night without having to worry about your door being kicked down and dragged off by Americans to a prison run by Americans where you would be tortured by Americans. And an American, I'm deeply offended by this. We don't do this sort of thing. And yet, because we have operated in violation of the rule of law going into Iraq, we operate in violation of the rule of law in the occupation of Iraq. Christopher. Christopher, what were your feelings throughout the, the long haul of the, the Clinton administration and on into the, the early months of the Bush administration with respect to the imposition of sanctions? And Madeleine Albright's assertion that it's worth the deaths, I think she said something to the effect that 500, it's worth the deaths of 500,000 Iraqi yeah, children. Yeah, that was the Leslie Stahl estimate, I think. Yeah. Um, she just, what she, I mean, Madeleine Albright's a fool, but and has been, she, nothing she can do about it. But uh, <laughs> uh, what she meant is, what, whatever the figure is, yeah, we think it's worth it. That's more or less true. Right. Um, I, I, I reasoned it when I could for myself, and whenever I could, which is not infrequently, I asked my Iraqi and Kurdish friends what they thought about it. Um, and they said, well, look, it's terrible, um, and all our families are suffering very badly. But if the sanctions were lifted, there's no doubt that the surplus would go to try and rebuild weapons of mass destruction and to strengthen the regime, which is already profiting, ironically enough, from the sanctions themselves. In other words, the, it was like a prisoner's dilemma. Uh, the sanctions were hurting the people much more than the regime, but a lifting of them would benefit the regime much more than the people. Well, now, if you have a, a moral uh, crux of this kind, what you have to do, I think, is make a choice. I remember Kanan Makir putting it to me very, in a very principled way. He said, it would be quite unjustifiable to keep the sanctions going on Iraq, entirely unjustifiable, unless the end result was intended to be the removal of the Ba'ath Party. Only on that condition would it be justifiable. So I remember the anti-war movement, as it likes to call itself, would make, I thought, vastly exaggerated claims about the number of children dying, but no nonetheless, the number was very, very uh, scary. And why one would say, well, we could uh, put an end to that. Uh, but Saddam would have to go. Oh, that would be too high a price for us to pay. Now, this is part of the bad faith of today's left, it seems to me. You say to people, all right, you believe that every day Iraqi children are dying. That must or ought to invest you with a sense of urgency. That should stop really very quickly. Well, we could take, we could decapitate the regime, we could reopen Iraq for business, we could bring it back into the international community in the way from which it's excluded itself by aggression, by genocide, by dictatorship, and so forth. I said, no, that's, that sounds like a bit extreme. I think we let the kids go on dying and let Saddam stay in power. What is that? What is that? Christopher? That is the same what? No, no, I, I just... <laughs> I was just getting my trousers all right, off. All right, all right. Okay. Well, I, look, if I, if I haven't made the point that way, I wouldn't succeed in making it another. Um, I, I must, uh, there's a, a tiny bit left over from an earlier exchange. I, I'm, I must um, tie it up. Um, this repeated invocation of CIA authority uh, <laughs> makes me a little bit queasy. Um, I've spent a lot of time investigating the CIA. I've spent a lot of time investigating its many crimes and misdemeanors and its innumerable subversions of the United States Constitution about the preciousness of which I think Mr. Risha and I are agreed, and subversion also of the democratic constitutions of other countries. That's only half of the bill of indictment against the CIA. The other is its unbelievable incompetence. For what we now know to be a 400 billion intelligence operation, though we're not supposed to know, even that budget, this 
This agency is so reliable it doesn't even want to know how much we spend on it, let alone be audited. In return for that, the only American able to infiltrate the Taliban was John Walker Lind of Marin County, California. <laughs>
Uh, Saddam was so secular, in fact, that he put a verse of the Quran on the Iraqi flag, where it had never been before, built a huge mosque in his own name, uh, wrote a Quran which he says was written in his own blood. It's certainly blood. There was a lot spare going around in Iraq at the time. Uh, turned uh, Iraq into, and its media into uh, an openly jihadist uh, forum, uh, constantly pumping out the theme of holy war, subverted the PLO by openly paying for the Islamist suicide bombers among the Palestinians, uh, allowed uh, his media to welcome the attack on the World Trade Center in 2001, the only regime in the world to do so, and suddenly, and lo and behold, and here's one thing that Colin Powell did actually get right in that terrible speech at the UN, Al-Qaeda people from Afghanistan find themselves turning up in Iraq. Again, a country not that easy to get into or get out of, including Mr. Abu Musab al-Zakawi, who, as a, as a Jordanian freelance with no previous experience in Iraq, seems to have done quite well to me, emerging as a leader of a quite impressive movement that seems to know where everyone lives and how a lot of the power grids work and th other things like that that are very useful for campaigns of terror, almost as if he was working with the former police of a former regime who'd kept the records and understood how things worked. In fact, it's even thinkable that he knew these people before and that uh, the fact that there's now an obvious, direct, clear, day-by-day, -day, intimate cooperation between Ba'athism and bin Ladenism may not have started just because George Bush was mean to them. It's possible, it's thinkable that that was in train before and that some such horrible mutation would have been the successor regime in Iraq. So we're not talking about punishing the last one because we took care of that. We're talking about forestalling the next one. And for these and other reasons that I've given, I think it would be very rash, in fact, it would be very irresponsible to overlook the possibility of a Hitler-Stalin pact of a collusion between Ba'athism and bin Ladenism, especially since that very mutation is now our deadliest foe. Thank you. Scott, and then you. <laughs> well, I'll just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off by thanking Mr. Hitchens for everything he's said here tonight, because it does represent something, and, and you rightly pointed this out, a process of debate, discussion, and dialogue that must take place if we are to call ourselves citizens of the United States of America. We may be in disagreement, but we're not in disagreement about this process that's taking place here tonight. So having said that, um, I have to say that I, I take uh, considerable exception to, to some of the um, facts that, that were just put out there. Well, we'll start off with um, Afghanistan in September 11th. You know, I, like others, watched the events of September 11th unfold before me on television with horror. One of the first things that came out of my mouth is, uh, why did this happen? Who are these people and why are they attacking us? These are important questions to ask and they're important questions to have answered before we take the next step of responding. You see, without asking that question and demanding the answer, you haven't a clue what you're doing. To simply go off to Afghanistan and wage war against what? Al-Qaeda? Against the Taliban? I mean, I remember watching an American uh, Navy commander brief the American people as the air war was begun. And he said, our first task was to destroy the integrated air defense of the Taliban. There was no integrated air defense of the Taliban. They had <laughs> targets. They were bombing. They didn't know what they were bombing. We were simply responding because of the president's visceral need to be seen as doing something after the horror of September 11th. And because of that, we have neither, we have neither destroyed al-Qaeda, nor have we destroyed those who gave safe haven and succor to al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda still exists, Osama bin Laden still exists, and some can make the case that Osama bin Laden's stature today among the Islamist fundamentalists who are anti-Western in nature has risen tremendously because of our inability to deal with him effectively. Now we move on to the issue of Iraq, trying to make a linkage between what occurred on September 11th and Iraq. We'll start with pre-September 11th. Yes, Mr. Yassin did, in fact, mix the explosives. And he did try to take down the World Trade Center. I don't know what his motivations are. I'll leave that up to the FBI and the relevant law enforcement agencies cool. in the United States to make that determination. That. He did go to Baghdad, where, as the government of the United States knows full well, he was not received with open arms 
by Saddam Hussein's regime, but arrested and placed not in a villa where he lived luxuriously, but placed under house arrest. One of the first things the Baghdad government did is approach the United States and say, how can we transfer this man to you? They met repeatedly in Jordan and in Turkey with representatives of the State Department and the CIA to negotiate the transfer of Yasin to the United States. The one thing that the Iraqis wanted was a signed document from the United States saying they have received Yasin in good health. The United States refused to sign that. The Iraqi government refused to turn him over. But to imply that somehow he, received, he was received by Baghdad as some sort of hero for trying to attack America is wrong. Now we'll talk about the other, Abu Nidal. Yes, he lived in a villa. Yes, he lived. He was not under house arrest. Why? Because the United States negotiated having Abu Dindal sent to Iraq as part of a deal with the PLO in the aftermath of his reign of terror. This is not Saddam Hussein saying, live here and function freely. This is America negotiating his release to Iraq, and the CIA knows this full well. So we can't talk about Saddam Hussein somehow being in bed with these terrorists, anti-American terrorists, prior to September 11th, nor we can we talk about a link between Saddam Hussein and the forces of Osama bin Laden. Saddam Hussein, secular? Not totally, but nor is he a Wahhabist fundamentalist. In fact, if you take a look at Saddam Hussein's record as a dictator of Iraq, he declared war against Wahhabism, against uh, uh, Islamic fundamentalism. If you proselytize in the name of Wahhabism inside Saddam Hussein's dictatorship and were caught, you were given summary justice. This is why Fallujah is not only a hotbed of anti-Americanism today, it was a hotbed of anti-Saddamism during the 1990s. One reason why Saddam Hussein invoked the name of Allah on the flag as an effort to reestablish his legitimacy with a constituency that was losing faith in the secular nature of the Ba'athist regime. I'm not saying Saddam was a genuine Islamist, but he played that game very well. But to make the link between September 11th and Iraq is absurd in the extreme. And it's wrong, and it's morally wrong. I mean, this is what the President of the United States does every time he makes a speech to this day. He gets up there and he invokes the horror of September 11th and then mentions Iraq as if Iraq was part of the global war on terror. You know, when we say global war on terror, what are we talking about? The United States has a definition of terrorism out there that basically precludes the United States as ever being defined as a practitioner of terror. But when you take a look at, when you speak of a nation that says the ends justify the means, and that's basically what we're saying here today. Forget all about how we got the war in Iraq. We got rid of Saddam Hussein, and that made it worth it. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you right now, if you buy into the notion of the ends justify the means and you call yourself an American, throw your passport on the ground and get the hell out of my country because America is about the rule of law, due process. The ends don't justify the means. The means justify the ends. You know, uh, Scott, I, I, it was interesting what you said when you, when you talked about... No, 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 no. Take it easy. We'll get to that. Wait, Scott, you talked about Saddam putting the, uh, the paean of praise to Islam on the flag as a way of his restoring his credibility amongst the religious zealots of his country who were suspicious of him for his secularism. It's kind of like what liberal Democrats do here in the United States when they talk about their belief in God and faith, isn't it? I'm not making that comparison. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, Christopher, if you'd like to respond with I'll a parry to that last thrust, the flag. Uh, then the way, we'll go to the people. By the way, I, uh, it's quite, I, I shouldn't have said it was a verse from the Quran. It is, in fact, Allahu Akbar. It's the invocation from the, that's on the flag. It was put there after the uh, war with Iran, uh, which was a war considered by the Iranians to be religious, of course. Uh, but it was increasingly fought by Saddam as a religious war as well. I think... Um, Rather than tell you all about how when, when I met Abu Nidal, the CIA would neither have heard of him nor known where he was and certainly didn't broker his presence in Baghdad because it was before his reign of terror, which was being planned in Baghdad. When I met him, he wasn't even a known name. And again, I don't trust anything the agency says under this heading. Um, and before I go on about the uh, other suggestive comparisons, the way that Saddam Hussein was trying to build his own 
jihadist front. In other words, possibly even in rivalry as well as in some collusion with bin Laden, the repeated meetings between al-Qaeda and Iraqi officials well documented in Sudan, the pretext given by Mr. Richard Clark, who you will remember, for the bombing of Sudan was because Osama bin Laden was running a factory that was mixing the chemical weapons for the Iraqi Ba'ath Party. That was the official position of the Clinton administration that year. It's open to criticism. I criticized it myself. But there's every reason to think that in Sudan a big collusion was going on. I repeat, this is not about the last one. It's about the next one. Though I am, I must say, fascinated to find that uh, Mr. Ritt has not convinced that the Taliban was the host government for al-Qaeda. And I was rather amazed at the applause he got for that admittedly daring assertion. Perhaps the applause was for how daring it was. But it's not what judge. I admitted at all. <laughs> I acknowledge that the now, Taliban gave safe haven and suckers al-Qaeda. As for Mr. Yassin, the case is also opposite. For yeah, one I, thing, I as for Mr. Yassin, the case is also opposite. Uh, everyone, apart from the fact everyone in Baghdad was under house arrest at that time, it's, it is well known and was documented by a visiting film crew. The man was on the loose. And to blame the United States government for not getting him back when Iraq is harboring someone who has just tried to make one tower of the World Trade Center collapse into the other, and to blame the technicalities of this, on the, of this extradition on the United States instead of the government that will not, I'll use the word, render this guy to us, is, I think, simply to blame the victim, which in this case is the United States. Poor old superpower that it is. It can be a victim too, all right? So I mean, I'm sorry to say that everything Mr. Ritter just said was the most utter balls. What was and it? ignoring, ignoring even the possibility, even the possibility, which has to be admitted, that there is a, why is Osama bin Laden's force all deployed? Why is it all deployed in defense of Saddam Hussein? Why does bin Laden issue his own fatwa saying, socialists though they are, our forces are entitled and in fact ordered to fight on their side against the main enemy. Uh, it's an announcement of cooperation. Why is the only outfit in Iraq that did any fighting against the coalition as it drove up to Baghdad, an enterprise in which Mr. Ritter didn't believe, didn't believe the possibility of, uh, the, the only people who stood and fought were the Fedaheen Saddam, a special paramilitary state militia whose name tells you everything, the Fedaheen Saddam a new force made up of Ba'ath Party thugs and imported foreign jihadists whose uh, visa applications have since been found and documented and many of them, they, when they say they want the purpose of visit to Iraq to join Fedaheen Saddam, make jihad. Well, Sweet when they put it like that. The these, were the people, no, excuse, these were the people who were hoping to be the successor force. The, everybody knew that the time of the Saddam regime was limited. Uh, he was losing his mind. His sons were probably quarreling among themselves. The regime was imploding and collapsing. Neighboring countries were casting coveting, uh, covetous eyes. If we hadn't invaded, it would have been Turkey, Iran, and Saudi Arabia that had invaded on behalf of their proxies. There would have been a terrible religious and civil and confessional war. The, the people who were bidding to come out on top in this new Afghanistan, this new combination of rogue state and failed state, was going to be the Ba'athist, uh, bin Ladenist mutation uh, Fedahin Saddam that's now fully rebaptized and rebranded as Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia. It is absolutely idle, idle to overlook this connection. And it, in fact, it deserves a great deal more scrutiny and a great deal more disclosure from our incompetent intelligence services than it has received. Well, Christopher, if whatever they're called, Fedahin Saddam or whatever, can you really, A, fault them, or B, link them to Osama bin Laden because they're fighting back when people land and invade their country? It wasn't their country, my dear. Um, the Fedaheen Saddam is, is, an is an international brigade of jihadists mustered by Ba'athist secret policemen. You want to identify this with Iraqi patriotism? Your problem. Maybe. Another question, and then we're going to get to the people's questions. Is it possible? All right, all right, all right already. Is it possible, since the United States has finite resources in terms of soldiers, men, material, intelligence resources, etc., that by diverting it all to Iraq, making that the triage priority, that we are overlooking the greater global war on terrorism against international jihadism? which many people would agree is a problem and a threat. Uh, it, let's admit the possibility, but let's notice that the 
international jihadists appear to have decided that Iraq is the place where the issue between us has been joined. Scott, and if they want to be taken up on it, I think that they should, since the alternative is leaving Iraq to them, and I would describe that in one word as unthinkable. Scott, it, the jihadists will never have Iraq. Rejoinder for that before these people are getting restless. Well, I would just make... All right, all right, all right. I, I would share the observation that I, too, am no, perplexed no. by Zarqawi's sudden uh, transformation from third-rate Jordanian criminal into terror mastermind who operates inside Iraq uh, with a sophistication that um, is beyond his apparent means. Uh, the only, and I agree with you, the only organization capable of running a sophisticated network of cells, operatives, uh, from the north to the south, the east and the west, is the former security apparatus of Saddam Hussein. And this is where we now part ways. Because, you see, I think the CIA, this agency that we both share somewhat of a disdain for, has learned in the aftermath of the occupation of Iraq that Saddam Hussein had been preparing for the eventuality of an American occupation for some time, and in fact instructed his security apparatus to melt back in to the nation awaiting the occupation, and then to seek to use the classic uh, approach of terrorists. How do you defeat an occupation? You must, first of all, make sure that the occupation does not win the hearts and minds of the people of Iraq. You do this by inflicting terror chaos, anarchy, and they do this very well, but they will never win the hearts and minds of the Iraqi people if the terror, chaos, and anarchy is linked to the former Ba'athist regime or whatever new version of how they want to call themselves. They must create a proxy, and the proxy created after the invasion was Zarqawi. Zarqawi is a front for the former Ba'athist regime of Saddam Hussein. They used these jihadists as expendable rounds of ammunition to inflict horrific terror and horrific chaos, horrific anarchy. But to call this al-Qaeda is to lose sight of who's really calling the shots in Iraq today when it comes to the insurgency. It's not al-Qaeda. It's not Osama bin Laden. It's the former government and regime of Saddam Hussein who is waging this insurgency. And until which time we recognize this, we will never be able to defeat it. No, no, no. Well, most of that's true. Some of it's in the wrong order. The only word that's wrong is when you say it's after. The collusion with Zakawi began before, which is why it's important to notice that Saddam's regime was the patron of jihad. Um, thank you very much, Christopher Hitchens and Scott Ritter. And Jay Diamond, who did this on one day's notice, thank you very, very much. Um, that's it? I want